for today's episode. Uh, guess who we have? Okay, before they you, come with me. So let me thank you for granting uh, uh, me this space uh, to be interviewed. Uh, my name is Senator Tolu Odebi. I represent uh, the good people of the West and the United States. And I am a first time senator here um, at the National Assembly. Uh, well, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just maybe retract a little bit. Uh, before I became a senator, I was the chief of staff of the state governor. So I was chief of staff of the state governor, uh, Senator, Excellency Senator Mikhail Abdus. And uh, prior to that, uh, I'm, also, I'm also born into a political family. Uh, I lived father of the senator uh, before he died. Before then, he was, uh, he was uh, very active in the Western region, he was the Minister for Finance. I was appointed as Minister for Education, so I come from a political background. But having said that, I think my foray into politics was actually made possible by Senator Kulamos, because really he was one that called me and invited me to come and serve uh, in his cabinet when I was going to go to the state. So I'd like to kind of like All right. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, coming from a political family and ending up here, you know, we'd just like to know, is this something that you always thought about doing at some point, watching your dad and all of that? Well, well thank you for asking. Well, I think naturally, as, as uh, maybe the only son of my father, I think naturally you, you aspire one day uh, to take up of leadership role that you be used you used to see uh, growing up, um, and also the focus on service uh, to humanity, the uh, love of community is something you grew up seeing around you. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, you I you never know it has become ingrained in you growing up because when you go to school and you go abroad and you did that, you just never saw it coming. Uh, but uh, I think I I felt a sense of responsibility. I must be honest with you, uh, for my community. Uh, after my late father passed, I think I I knew the environment was very dear to him. I knew service was something he held very dear. I contributed, and and I felt like um, you know. Thanks. You can be opportune to have been given this platform um, while it's away, uh, living your life, either in Lagos or abroad, or anything. Um, and that at least, you know, uh, you, sh you, sh you should use that opportunity to see how you can also continue to help uh, your community. But having said that, when I when I came back to Nigeria in 2001, um, and you know, when the whole political process started. Um, you know, you cannot but be concerned about the state of affairs in the country. Um, you know, you, 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 you watch things gradually deteriorating. Um, you, can, you can shrug it off that it doesn't affect you as much. But as time goes on, you can see that even and so called so called comfortable people are starting everybody's trying to feel the bite. Because certain things are universal, whether light is gone for hours and you are spending so much money on generators, the school fees are becoming very exorbitant, uh for security is becoming an issue. You realize that there's a need we can't we must get involved. And one of the one of the driving force for me is that I just feel that we cannot expect the kind of country that we hope to have if we sit idle and, and live in a cocoon or, or barricade ourselves and grumble and criticize and get upset. We will not get that kind of country that we hope to have. It takes hard work. 
it is participation to get an involvement. And you have to do that. And if you know, if you are in a country of uh, 200 million and you belong to the class of people that have been educated, that have been exposed, that has enlightened, you have a sense of responsibility to get involved, to build a kind of country that the rest of the country, the rest of the people in the country can, can, can aspire for. And to me, I know those, I just feel that they need to get involved. And when I have the when I had the opportunity and I asked for concern, first as a member of the Judicial Service Commission in other states, even before I became Chief of Staff, it was just service. Uh, there wasn't that much money involved. You could just type in coming from Lagos to the states and maybe once a month. I, I did it because I still feel in the way of my focus was not on the position, was on the post. It was just how can I to contribute? And I think that transcends. I would believe probably my performance or, or character, whatever, because I mean, I say that I would have to what that led the government to have invited me to come and be his chief of staff. And that now dovetails into where we are today. That's amazing. Great. Good story. Um, so I'm curious, what, um, speaking of service and all of the things that inspire you that got you here, what are some of your biggest achievements so far? What are you thinking about it? Like, I'm so glad I made this choice. Well, I think. Is the impact that I've made in my community. Um, honestly, let me be honest with you, I haven't felt any higher sense of joy or fulfillment than serving my community. And I mean that, that's not even political, I serve my community, or even just service to humanity. I'm making that your contribution. Uh, you know, when you impact people that are even less fortunate than you are, and you see the tremendous impact it makes in their lives and the joy in their faces. You cannot but feel, feel fulfilled. Uh, for me, uh, the impact that I have made uh, is uh, it, it varies from, I mean, the numerous bills that I've passed that have impacted on my community, the programs that I have done that will make life better for them socioeconomically. Uh, the trainings that I've done to empower them to make them self-sufficient, the uh, leadership that I've provided uh, for people to believe in themselves and to, to raise hope, um, the you know, just a general contribution and feeling that that you are doing your best to contribute and provide positively to the development and social economic development of this country. Awesome. Right, thank you so much. So uh, that will lead me to. Yes, that question. Uh, so far, to the journey of the political journey, what are the challenges you think you know, Well, I mean, you know, what I would say, you know, first of all, what I hope is that we need to go back, before I talk about challenges, what I would like to see is that as a country, we need to go back to teaching, to start teaching uh, civic classes at a very early age. Teaching them about leadership, responsibilities, accountability, uh, um, and also at some level with our governance. I mean, what it entails and all that. I think people need we need to start doing that. I'm fortunate because I had a father who was a leader, who was, who had all those qualities, and I could. I mean, and that inspired me. But you know, the younger generation may not have. We will be fortunate to have that. But I think. If they are taught that at a very early age in the school, I think growing up, what to pick their interest, and secondly, it will also imbibe certain culture or values in them that will be, will can be right for positive for this country. Uh, in terms of challenges, um, uh, one thing I tell people is that there's a big difference between the corporate world and your political or government. You know, a lot of us that uh, came from the corporate background, you, you, you think, ah, why is anything, uh, you know, why, you know, something so simple like the decision you just made and yeah, I just made a decision, I mean, getting drunk, I mean, why are they uh, parabolating and, but you know, when I, when you now got into, um, uh, when you now, I remember when I was chief of staff, I had this policy, I'd like to file staying on my table for 24, for 24 hours, and I, as soon as I brought up on the, Commissioners and everybody with their 
uh, the ministry, you know, how they treat it, I go to the governor, the governor is still not available or has you know, go back again. I, I, it got to me, you know, because I I thought my role was impacted, my slowness was just, but I now realize government just has its processes and procedures and you know and, and, and it just what you think uh, the face value of it is added value, you have to look deeper. There might be other uh, considerations or political things or other interests. So those are things that you that it takes experience and it takes getting to know. But I think uh, on the political side, I think it is the first thing is uh, they're going to get is um, getting the people to know that you they really care, getting to people to really believe because. A lot of them have seen the elites or whoever as people that don't seem to care about their own issues, about their own feelings. And they took you that you are up there and they don't actually believe and they don't see when they're just coming to take advantage of them. But when they see that you immerse yourself with them, you share their pains, you genuinely care about them, uh, you're willing to sacrifice for them, uh, you actually start that great start on the ground. Uh, so I think that's one of the challenges initially, that, and especially if you're going through a political background, you know, they feel, oh, they become the sort of, the, become the sort of so, 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 uh, they simply want to come and then we are now, and we are worshiping the family, you know. But, but thank you, thank God that. I had, I had a father that left a legacy of service, and, and I, I, I have all the choice to, to, to go on that regular course. I think so. That I think over time, people started to see that you are, you are very impactful, you, you mean well, you, you try your best to make a difference, uh, and all that. Now, the third challenge really is us, the latest one now, which is technology. This social media. You know, you guys, uh, you social media guys, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it's a lack of understanding of the, especially the youth population. But I, I understand that they're boiling, they have a lot of anger, some of them are graduated, there's no job, there's nothing to do. Social media is their it's the only outlet they can express their frustration. So when they see all the they're back of you know, you go there to say, yeah, we're right, you know. And unfortunately, there's no way to. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a new of frustration. But I think over time, you know, when they start seeing that you're making positive impact, you're, you're accessible to them, and all, I think all that's happening there. And then you can now start building, building, building that. For me, my focus has been in education. That's what I have been. I have the most impact. Uh, uh, it's how in education. Uh, and the reason being is that when I look at my community, my constituency, compared to the, the three central districts of the state, the east, central, and west, when I look at the east, which is mainly Jebu, they are more advanced politically, a bit of well off, and all that. They look at central because we are the only ones that have never been in government, we've never been had a government in the last 45 years of the state. We've never had an opportunity to. to we are the least developed. Uh, the level of poverty is a bit higher. You know, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I thought, okay, what can I do to make a difference in this environment? Uh, it's not about giving money. That's an easy way out. They can do, they get the money and they'll spend it. How can I make an impact? So what I first I did, I looked at, okay, let me look at what the best and the brightest amongst us. The academically gifted university students, tertiary institutions with their students in the West. I, I said, you know, let me harness them. So I uh, my foundation we put out an advert that if you have a minimum of 2.5 GPA or whatever, that and you and you do and you are from my constituency and from university. And you meet our criteria, I'll sponsor you until you graduate from university. So we did that, and I'm able to, we were able to get a lot of people. We weeded out those that are not from my constituency, those that are not with the GPA, we go to their schools, and we're able to harness, I mean, 
we, the, 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 the first set of students about two or three years ago. And all I see them right now as I'm sitting here, I have a hundred university students that are in the university uh, to graduate. But what is impressive for me, and I have them on my WhatsApp, it's not only the screen the school fees, I'm like a major to them. They're my WhatsApp group, I talk to them, I share things with them. When I read a good story, I throw it in there. Oh, thank you, Daddy. They know to motivate them, to encourage them, to you know, they talk to and so that you give them that guidance. First of all, they're academically gifted. I mean, and the criteria is they cannot go like below that GPA or else I won't pay the next year's school fees. So you have to give them something for to have it. And the whole idea is that because they're gifted academically, when they graduate, it will be easier to, to, get, to get them a job or for them to find a job because of their smart and the level of academic uh, achievement. And hopefully when they get a job, they'll be able to go back home and help their sibling uh, to and hopefully we'll be able to change that cycle of poverty. You know, and that is the whole strategy behind that. And all the other things that we are doing. But academic, uh, and then all of them were given laptops. I brought in uh, the last, uh, the last uh, scholarship we did. I brought in guys from the fintech world, young guys like who to talk to them to understand what is happening globally. I to tell them that look, you know, you need to start whatever you're studying in biotechnology. Understand what is happening. The world is changing. They become more digitalized. You need to get involved. So I gave them all, the, all of them laptops. I made sure that you know, I expose them, and, and that's the kind of leadership that I want to give. I mean, it's not political because I mean, I'm not. This kid may not even be able to vote for you, when, but you have to look at the future, you know. And that is what I'm trying to do. Thank you so much. You know, you know, uh, you know. I let me say that. You know, one of the things that people say about me, especially with my constituency, is that you know, even when I do all these programs, or I do all these uh, uh, empowerment things, I don't commission, I don't do that because you know, I, I feel it's you know, it's it's uh, it's that self glorification. You know, it's more than that for me. To me, it's about. It's about changing the livelihood and the, and the lives of people. Uh, and, and I believe that my achievement, yes, at the end of the day, every year, we catalog everything I've done every year, and let people see what my achievements have been. And in terms of bills, it varies. I think I, I, if I can remember, right, because there are so many, I've done the uh, National Border Institute, uh, which is to be cited in my constitution in Mexico. Uh, and the reason being that Nigeria is a big country, and it's a poorest country. We have over 2,500 or so entries into countries that cannot be mapped. The demographics are changing. You know, uh, there's migration coming from the Sahel, there's banditry coming in, there is uh, all kinds of things that are happening around the border. Look at what happened at that task. Demographics are people are moving, other moving, and everyone is taking, taking uh, moving to Nigeria. And then, so we have all these things that are happening. So there needs to be an institute like anywhere else in the world you know, that trains people to understand the demographics and, and the real-time information about your boundary, what is happening, what is the life of the life of people around the boundary, what exactly is going, and also to train people on boundary management. You know, people even from the immigration, even from the customs can tell, you know, with the human trafficking and what is happening. And so this is a real institute that is specially focused on boundary management, boundary development, boundary, that kind of all kind of thing. And it will be, yeah, I mean, I know there's quite a few of them in Europe, but it's probably the first in Africa. And hopefully that will bring more people to come and study here. And then because what I what we foresee is that if you don't have a good grasp of your boundary, the next conflict of the world is going to be about boundaries because everybody, you know, everybody is going to be fighting for their space. So that is there. Uh, I also did a bill on. Uh, you have to remind me now. So you have to give them. Okay, you have. Okay, you give them all yes. my bills. Uh, I also did a bill on uh, uh, chartered industry of risk management. Uh, they want to become chartered, and, and I think it's a good thing because we need to also look at, I mean, uh, risk assessment and risk analysis of what some of our, some of our, whether it's credits or some of our uh, 
instruments and all that stuff to uh, access that. I'm doing a deal on um, uh, securitization on uh, on uh, government documents or instruments. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, one of the issues we've had in why the certificates, uh, whether it's a T bill certificate, whether it's all this, you know, there's a need for us to securitize them backward. Technology has come now so that you know all these issues will fake. NYC certificate or fit driver's license. You know, any government issued instrument must be backloaded you know, so that security agency, when they look at it, can tell whether it's fake or not. You know, you not you have to be going digging and looking at you know. So that to me is another area we can spend looking for ways, you know, to solve some of our issues. That's another issue um, that we that we have. Uh, there's another bit on uh, Bonds. Eh? Bonds. Bonds. Okay, Bonds Institute. Okay. Yeah, that is also brought to the because okay. I also realized that there is no uh, hospitals like just general hospitals and all that. And because of, I mean, you see the fire exposure by these tankers and, uh, or pipeline exposure that the whole of communities have been liberated, uh, maybe on the express road about 20, 40 cars. Uh, you look at the social accident, we don't have any bond, specialized bond institute in Nigeria where they can, you know, they do skin grafting, where they can take care of people because there's also rehabilitation for months. I mean, thank God that girl that have to to South Africa and social so much and all that. You can get into that diet. The doctor does die because they go to general hospital and then they get infected. They are, they are not trained for treating things like that. So, like, there's need for us to have a bond institute. You know, that's, you know, we have specialists that, I mean, there, that's where I think there's also rehabilitation, psychotherapy, there are all kinds of things that is instead. So I have that, uh, that we, that I also need. I'm also looking at NYC, that one I'm not, I haven't perfected yet. I feel the NYC that was a, is a very good program of its time when it started. However, the world has moved a bit. And we need to be preparing our kids for the reality of the world to come. Uh, entrepreneurship, uh, digital uh, economy uh, is the focus that we need to start looking at. There's not going to be more unemployment. Let's, uh, let's accept that fact globally. So that there's going to be more employment because digital revolution is going to outpace. I mean, it's going to displace a lot of people. What we know as it today, even I understand from you lawyers that computers now, IBM has a system now that can solve a lot of legal issues within a, a, a fraction of a second. I mean, and that kind of system. So the, the, the technology is moving at such a faster rate than mankind. And we need to get on top of it. Now they're talking of uh, cryptocurrency, they're talking of network. A lot of things are going on right now that even globally, everybody is uncertain and how it's going to be, how destructive it's going to be. And with that, you're going to foresee more agitation, fighting, and instability if governments are not careful due to the vast unemployment. So, skill development, entrepreneurship, and really digital area, digital knowledge is the way to go. And universities must ensure it's incorporated into their curriculum. I mean, and everybody will be fast in it. It's also important that whatever our economic focus is, whatever our effort is, it should be in, it, it should be in line with our education focus. I've always said this, I believe that when whatever our, our, our vision is as a country, if we want to be a knowledge-based economy in 2050, we should make sure that it's in tandem with the educational policy that we are building the competences that will enable us to achieve that education. So if you can say you're an elite based economy, but you're not just doing the psychology, you're not, and then you're not get there, you don't, you don't have you don't have the brain power, you don't have the skill set to help you develop and transform into that kind of economy that you want, you're not going to get it. So those are the kind of things. So I have so I can name so many I can go on and on, but you can see that. Thank you so much for your time.
So at the party where we don't know if you would like to align the young aspirant, the young aspirant that we should go into politics. Yes, well, first of all, it's uh, it's not that going into politics. Let me first of all say that first of all, let me thank you for this uh, for inviting me to your platform and this is a very noble uh, thing that you are doing. Because when I first saw your invite, you know, the legal firm and all that was it. You voted by the special focus on lawmakers and uh, public servants and all that stuff. Um, I can only encourage uh, the young ones, first of all, one, not to give up, not to despair. Please don't despair. Uh, the world is even getting more interesting and getting more, um, uh, you know, getting, getting, getting more diverse. Uh, I, I would encourage you that your focus of going into politics should be to make a difference. Please don't go into politics just because you want to get a position. I, I can tell you, I didn't, I didn't say how to call, I didn't say that, oh, I want to buy me a tea for staff, how to buy me Go to politics because you genuinely feel you want to contribute and be impactful. If you just go into it because you're designed, just because you want to be an other rep or you want to be this, you're going to be, you're going to be, dis you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be heavily disappointed because when you get into the, the kata kata of politics, you know, we are going to be a smart, we are going to have people that are going to backstab, you're going, going to just be dis disappointed. But if your desire, just as you are doing now, and everybody can contribute in their own way, you don't all have to be a political person. What you are doing is very vital. You are creating a platform for the young people. Somebody who is in the corner of this home, despair of, of this, listening to you. You are creating a platform for them to understand what you know, uh, uh, opportunities that are out there. So you don't all have to be a senator or an artist. You can all contribute in various ways. And so for me, the key is, first of all, have a burning desire that you want to make a difference, you want to serve. When you are doing it, you might even feel as if you are, you are doing politics because it seems natural for you. You just want to make a difference in people's lives and be a part of their life. So for me, once and once you do that, trust me, community people will see your contribution, will see your effort. They will be the one to say, "No, this person is the person that we want. He served us. He lived amongst us. He, he did a whole role for us without even asking for anything." Because he saw the suffering that we are going through and that kind of thing. They themselves, and there is no greater joy than to be pushed by a community than you imposing your community that I want to I want to be your, your representative. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you so much. We are glad to thank you. We have a good team. Thank you very much.